for many of the fitness people, even if there's a little bit of latency on the heart rate when you do hard intervals, that's not the end of the day. But for professional athletes, it's it's very key to get within like one or two beats uh, and, and have a high degree of re repeatability. People who do fitness and um, are engaged in wellness, yeah, they want to improve their life quality. Their, they want to stay healthy, um, but also uh, sometimes it can be almost like a little bit of a healthy addiction where people push their bodies to the limit and and uh, they want to really um, improve the efficiency of their workouts. So um, digital devices and knowledge about your data, uh, about your body in form of data um, that gives you certain um, hints about your nutrition, um, uh, stress level, um, whatever it might be, could really help there. Um, then uh, we also have a fitness industry that um, is going to um, th go through uh, a lot of changes or is going to be changed uh, a lot at the moment or in the near future. And all these topics um, are part of today's um, discussion. And, and uh, we have a great um, lineup to present to you. And I would like to ask all the panelists to come on stage now. Um, the panelists will quickly introduce themselves one by one um, before we then start the common discussion and um, the questions. You're very welcome to also um, formulate your questions in the chat. Um, Anna is um, going to respond to them and, 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 and collect them and then direct them to the, to the audience. Uh, sorry, to me, to the moderator. So we are still waiting for Mark, I guess. And then the panel is, is it, no? Um, then the panel should be complete. Um, so let me, maybe I can give you a quick overview about um, the lineup. So we have Mark Herbst, who's yet to come to the, to join the panel. He's um, the performance manager at Exos at Google. Then we have Paul Robbins, um, represented by the black screen, but the audio is working well. So sorry for the inconvenience with the video issues here, but I think it won't do any harm to our quality of conversation here. Paul Robbins is vice president of sports performance at Kinexon, uh, which has been very big in the media lately. And Marco Zuvilaxo, right, um, is the former chief strategy officer at Polar Electro and currently working as a mentor for various well-reputed brands in the fit tech industry. So um, since Mark is not here, I would suggest that, <laughs> that um, maybe um, Paul, um, if you would like to go ahead and uh, give a short intro in the, your work, um, give a few information, a little bit of information about your background. My Paul, presentation real quick. Yeah, so if you could bring it up and share your screen, perfect. Informa a little bit of information. Okay. About um, like Thomas said, uh, I work for uh, Kinexon. Um, <laughs> yeah, so if you could bring it up and share your screen, perfect. Informa a little bit of information. Okay. About <clears throat> like Thomas said, uh, I work for uh, Kinexon. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so if you could bring it up, share your screen. Perfect. What happened? All right, I believe you can see my screen now. So um, Good. basically uh, what we do is we are a, a digital company that uh, mainly in sports, but we also have a, an industrial side as well that we'll talk a little bit about in um, uh, this presentation as well. There's something that we pivoted in, during this uh, pandemic. Um, but my main focus is working on sports. The NBA is our biggest client um, right now, but we also have uh, clients in uh, Germany for both uh, 
uh, handball and soccer um, and a little bit of basketball there as well. We do some ball tracking and we uh, also work with the media. Um, basically, the, uh, the technology is our radio frequency, our RFID tracking. Uh, where the athletes will be wearing a tag uh, on them as we're uh, performing in either game or in practices. Uh, we set up our antennas around the court or on the pitch um, so we can create um, the our own technically GPS type of uh, tracking, but uh, it's uh, localized. So it's localized GPS. And then we do a lot of analysis afterwards. My background is uh, I worked for... Uh, at that time, it was called Athletes Performance. Many know it now as EXOs. I was the metabolic specialist and one of the original five uh, coaches uh, starting with uh, Athletes Performance way back in 1999. And I was there for a uh, little over 10 years uh, running the uh, ESD program and, and assessments. Uh, then I s went and took this technology into uh, the NBA. And this is my 10th season in doing in-game data uh, consulting. Um, Started off with Sport View, uh, and now they're using Second Spectrum as their tracking devices. So my goal is just to take any raw data that we can and then analyze it and work with the teams. Um, now, for the last few years, I've been working with Connexon. This is our uh, second season bringing the, uh, the, the data into the NBA um, and into college basketball. Uh, my fifth year doing it with the USTA, so we'll be next week similar with the Hawkeye data, uh, collecting that uh, during the U.S. Open um, and analyzing uh, performance data for them. Um, and they also have the the system, the Connexon system in the their Orlando Training Center, the USTA. Uh, and we just started doing some of this in the NFL as well. So my background is exercise science, uh, but bringing uh, the, that actual science into using from the real game data and taking it from there. Some of the stuff that we do, uh, advanced stuff that we're working on right now is more what we call the clustering, where we can look at different players. Um, in this case, these are centers in the uh, the NBA and uh, player number one and player number two, you can see are drastically different based on their average power output and their pace. So now we can design conditioning programs, training programs to improve this. Uh, if we need to move number two up to be more powerful or even looking at different types of matchups. Um, and we do it also at the uh, league level as well um, and team level. So we can look and break down the quarters, what kind of pace they're doing, how does that match up from one team to another. Uh, so we're looking at some more strategy, how we bring performance into that strategy. So that's what we're working on now, we, again, work with most of the NBA, and now we're bringing a lot of this to the uh, European market. Again, handball, um, did a little bit last year, got uh, also the league-wide data from soccer and uh, a few basketball teams in Germany. So that's, uh, that's where I'm at right now, and uh, that's uh, what we're working on, and we'll discuss on this panel. Thomas, you're, you're uh, on mute. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Sorry, guys. Um, and thanks, Paul, again. Um, yeah, it's, uh, as I said, uh, um, it's super interesting to see how physical actions translate into a digital layer and how it's represented. Um, yeah, let's go on with um, Mark. Um, uh, since uh, Ixos was uh, mentioned um, by Paul, uh, I think that's a good transition because uh, Mark is um, the performance manager at Ixos at Google. So, Mark, the stage is yours. Thank you very much, Thomas, and apologies for my delay. I had a, a, a short technical issue, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm very happy to be here. And first and foremost, I want to thank uh, Thomas and the team to set the, to set this up. I think it's a great opportunity for us to share some thoughts, so um, kudos to your, your team. Um, yeah, my name is Mark. I'm, um, I'm a regional performance manager for Exos, uh, working out of Zurich in uh, Switzerland. So for uh, the one of you who don't know Exos, Exos is a, we have a 20 year anniversary um, in 2019, so founded in 1999 of Mark Verstegen. Um, as Paul said, we were formerly called Athletes Performance. 
and also core performance. Um, so um, we consider ourselves as one of the leaders in uh, the proactive health and the uh, performance um, area. Um, the heritage of Exos is working with uh, semi-professional and professional athletes. So uh, the headquarters uh, is in uh, Phoenix. So we are a US-based company. And um, the, um, the general idea and the mission was that we kind of bring um, four uh, program pillars underneath one um, rooftop to kind of serve the best service for uh, the athletes to um, evolve as good as possible uh, based on mindset, nutrition, movement, and recovery. So those are the four uh, program pillars of, of Exos, and you might have heard um, about that before. Now, in the last um, about 10, 12 years, there was a rapid growth um, for the organization, which was great. So there was a growth inside of the US, but then also um, internationally, in um, also into various departments. So there are three major departments right now, um, which is uh, working with professional athletes in our facilities and also with some performance specialists in different teams. We work with the military in the US and um, in the area where I am in is called Exos Works. So we do work with the system which was kind of evolved over the years with athletes um, in with our um, corporate partners. And the two biggest, we have various corporate, uh, corporate partners, but the two biggest ones are Adidas and Google. And um, that kind of uh, um, uh, transitions into my role. So I'm a regional performance manager in our Google um, account. Exos is the partner with Google for about 10 years in um, kind of forming their uh, health and performance um, operations inside of the company, inside of a growing um, tech giant as Google is. And um, so I do, um, I have my background in sports science as well. I do have an ex um, a very expanding experience in coaching, personal training, and then also kind of working remotely with some of the teams uh, we have of performance coaches inside of Google. And I'm now overseeing several teams inside of um, EMEA. Um, so that's my, my main role. Um, it's a very interesting time at the moment we are in, um, a time of evolving um, corporate fitness, um, re-identifying it with uh, the abilities, what technology can bring, um, as well as the um, focus on the um, individual, what we can really do evolving on the client's needs and um, the future uh, possibilities. I do have some experience with um, consulting some fit tech clients and um, some um, some work in the um, test and learn um, scenarios with new um, areas of uh, development inside of the fit tech area. So yeah, super excited to be here. Thank you, Mark. Um, very exciting as well to, I'm looking forward to learn more about coaching and personal training. Um, and final panelist, um, Marco, um, would you like to give sure. great. your insights to the Thanks, audience? Thomas. Thanks, Thomas. Great, uh, great to be here with you guys, uh, with both Thomas, Mark, and Paul. And, and uh, yeah, Marco Civiloxo. My background is such that uh, um, after an initial part of my career, I started in Canada. In international marketing and uh, in um, uh, business development, I uh, transferred over to Finland, and I've been living here for about 20 years now. Initially, I was in the telecom sector, but then I finally had an opportunity in 2002 to join Polar. And uh, my background in Polar was very much initially starting in product management, focusing on developing the first vertical categorization of uh, running products. And uh, the let's say user user centric uh, uh, approach that that I applied worked really well, and uh, we started to scale that throughout the whole product management organization, throughout the team, throughout the years. Uh, things just progressed, uh, went very very well, and uh, as I uh, rose through the organization, I had the opportunity to work with lots of different teams and um, and uh, different roles within the company, including branding and. Ultimately, uh, uh, my career at Polar uh, concluded. Uh, I was uh, at the chief strategy officer uh, last year. And throughout the years at Polar, we just did, did a lot of pioneering work in the wearable uh, tech category and uh, had the opportunity to work with a lot of great companies on different types of projects, whether it be Adidas or Nike or Google 
uh, you know, and a, a whole raft of different apps companies uh, as well that we collaborated with over throughout the year. So uh, I just developed a, a pretty broad perspective of the category and uh, and um, uh, how to map out good strategies that that scale over time. And um, now it's really my role now is uh, I'm, I'm working with a range of different uh, entities around the world, uh, companies uh, ranging from startups to larger entities, investors that are looking just for insights on the category, what's happening, uh, and you know, um, just giving them uh, feedback and, and being able to uh, come up with uh, uh, formulate plans. So that's where I am now, and uh, it's uh, it's really happy to be here tonight with you guys. Thank you, Marco. Um, it, yeah, thanks, thanks everybody for the the introductions. Um, and I would like to start the um, the the conversation in a little bit um, outlining the state of today. Like, where are we? How? Like, what what is being used um, in in daily practice? Uh, um, yeah, what is the state of today? So maybe, uh, Mark, if you if you would like to give a few um, uh, insights in how you work with your clients, how you use technology. Yeah, um, absolutely. So I think the last couple of, of months has been um, very dynamic, very interesting, very challenging, I think, for, for most of us, you know. Um, and um, the current situation with the, the coaches, what I have in the team, and then expanding to the clientele, what we work with, is that obviously um, the um, in a corporate context, um, 95% of the employees work from home. So this kind of really changed the whole dynamics. And I think a lot of the times when we talk about it, it's about um, what are some of the service offerings we do. But I think a more important question to ask is what is the new environment, what the clientele finds uh, themselves in. And that was one of the most important things. What, what we've learned over the last couple of months is that the demands and the profile of the client, what we used to work with um, in various settings changed drastically, you know? So the timing, the investment, the knowledge, um, the connectivity, so that all kind of changed. So bottom line is that obviously um, a whole bunch of streaming, you know, so a lot of the a lot of the access um, is over the on demand and, and streaming. We also have an understanding that people are reaching out to their coaches, to their personal coaches via and um, Zoom, via Google Meet, or via the, the, the platform what is available. Um, that is interesting. We also saw that there are people starting to, with uh, fitness routines and starting creating new, uh, new habits, what they haven't done before. So that kind of was an interesting learning for us um, as well. And um, thirdly, we also experienced that um, we saw that the people are kind of changing the rhythm of their of uh, their approaches, you know, so uh, more frequent, uh, less volume. So that was it. So the major to majorly answer you, we tried in the first couple of months to really provide um, easy, accessible information to continue. And now we are likely in that phase of understanding how we can evolve. Thank you. Um... Great, thanks. Uh, so, um, is there any ideas uh, towards that um, from from Mark or, or Paul? Well, I could. Uh, I would first of all, I would say, like, also on a big picture side, just the whole fitness category has really exploded, like in terms of growth during the COVID phase. There was an, a very short term disruption in the very beginning. But then, of course, uh, like as people started to, you know, get their senses back and the initial panic was over, huge investment in terms of like uh, home fitness equipment, uh, 170% uh, uh, increases depending on the market. Bike sales have exploded, you know, uh, in many places, a lot of bikes are sold out. And then, uh, you know, people just really want to take control of what they can control during this time of turmoil. Uh, and uh, people have recognized that uh, factors like background uh, fit health factors like obesity, hypertension, these types of things have then also uh, been like critical factors in influencing who lives and who who dies uh, if they're infected by COVID. So that's that's another big factor that's really impacted the way people behave. And you know, um, a lot of you know fitness device companies, fitness tech companies. I've just seen a huge influx 
of 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 people buying and uh, gravitating to the technology, uh, and then also like Mark mentioned, uh, a lot of the remote uh, coaching uh, has also started to pick up, and I think uh, the the devices have been part of that, part of definitely part of that uh, ex exchange. Mm -hmm. Thanks. <clears throat> yeah, you like Peloton, for example, is a. I don't know if you should call it a startup, but it's it's an immense company. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> the, startup valued at fifteen billion market yeah, cap. Yeah, exactly. So basically, they have skyrocketed, and <clears throat> um, it's it's a it's for home training, right? Then we have a new company that offers a mirror that. That, that with with which you can train. So, um, what do you guys think? Like, uh, is it going to stay? These things uh, after Corona has gone. What is your opinion? Um, will will we keep these technologies, or are we going back to analog sports? I would say that we're going to be keeping the, the better ones. Um, I think what's going to happen is a lot of them are going to start to. There's going to be a, a huge influx of. Uh, different technology out there just like there was a few years ago and then they will start uh whittling down the ones that really are, are useful are, are you really going to get good feedback is it going to help you does it make a difference uh again my role is more in the, the professional athlete so we've uh, really focused on that we can't have a, a lot of data we have to have just small pieces that are going to be very helpful uh, that's what we're really looking for. And I think that's what's going to happen with a lot of this technology is, right, are you actually getting something out of it? I, I think something like a Peloton will stick around because there's that interaction uh, and people are sticking with it. Uh, but there's other uh, technology. If you're just looking at uh, steps or, you know, in, in basic data, I think that's going to get old. Um, so it's how do you how do you use the data is very important. And where where is it being collected and how good the data is? Um, it's it's going to be very important. Good, thank thanks. Yeah. Um. Um. um sorry, <laughs> um, Paul. Uh, ha, like, if we talk about that, um, we can we can also talk about um, professional um, athletes' uh, fitness um, topics because um, I know that Kinex on you kind of pivoted into the topic so um can you give us a little bit of um insights on on where where the technology came from and now how it's used in professional sports and what the use is uh, because it's not always like to track body data but also maybe to keep the player safe and um could you elaborate on this again please Yes. So, uh, so again, our, our main focus was originally was, um, you know, just tracking players and, and it's a localized uh, system. So RFID tags, uh, very uh, good, um, reliable data. Uh, that's why it works very well in basketball inside. Uh, that's why it exploded so well in, in the NBA and, and now uh, some other uh, indoor like handball in Germany. But so it was just a, a, a tracking. Um, a lot of people are familiar with GPS and, and the, the tracking that that's done. Uh, here it's localized, so it's it's a lot, a lot more precise. So that's where we started, and that's again we're we're expanding in that market and, and doing very well in that market. But when uh, the pandemic hit, <clears throat> someone in our German office uh, was uh, brilliant, and they pivoted very quickly. And within a week, ten days, we had a device. It's called our Safe Zone, and and that device now uh, not only was it using that in the the bubble in the MBA for everyone um, all the media um, all the support uh, personnel uh, coaches it's a device that basically same type of uh, tracking but we're really just tracking one device to the other how close are they getting um, so if somebody are they within six feet of each other how long are they uh, in contact with someone and if they are if someone did get exposed uh, of it we can go back and look, all right, who uh, are the people that they might have infected? Uh, who's had the contact with them? So that's what we're really focused on and pivot very quickly. That's now jumped into all 32 NFL teams. They're doing their own technical type of bubble uh, at their own facilities, but they're all using it. And, and the players are actually wearing it in the NFL, even during practice. Um, so in industries, obviously, have, are – That had been jumping into us. We have an industrial uh, division already, so we do tracking of, you know, large um, 
parts, in tools, in you know supplies, in huge warehouses, in um, in factories. We've been doing that, but now we're actually tracking the personnel also in the uh, in the factory itself. How close are they getting? How long are they there? So it was a quick pivot, and it's something that exploded for us. Uh, and still is. I mean, there's companies that are still trying to implement this as people are coming back into the workplace um, and in sports. So they wanted to do it again. Will they try to use this for people that are coming back, fans coming back into the stadiums? Uh, how are they going to try to uh, monitor them? So, um, yeah, the, it was a uh, it was a quick thing, and, and uh, we're still still in development. But uh, they've done a great job, and it's expanded very quickly. Okay, great. Um, so, so technology is coming also to the professional um, business to keep the players safe because actually that's your capital, right? So, um, um, where can what else can be? Where else is technology used in the professional segment? Because um, we we have uh, uh, several different disciplines like uh, nutrition, um, as uh, as Mark said, um, nutrition, recovery, and sleep, right? And and training activities. Um, where do you see um, the in the professional environment where 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 technology could add um, to the to the success of a team, for example? Is it something that's already in use, or is uh, which of these components is 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 in, is in the focus most? <clears throat> uh, yeah, sleep and recovery is is the the main thing. I, uh, again, the NBA bubble is the, the focus we're going on right now, and I'm I'm trying to watch some of the uh, the updates. As you many have probably heard that uh, there was a, a stoppage of play yesterday in the uh, NBA. Um, I'm not sure if you guys had heard that, but they, they postponed all the games yesterday and today's games. And but I I think they're they're voting on uh, keeping it going right now. Uh, so. It's a, a very interesting situation down there, but in that bubble, what we've been trying to do is really work on that recovery uh, portion as well. So they've been using, uh, we've been, the NBA went with uh, oral ring. Uh, so the, all the athletes and coaches have uh, access to an oral ring to watch their sleep patterns uh, and look at heart rate variability, um, looking at recovery, uh, which has been very interesting in the bubble due to the fact that they, in the playoffs, normally there's lots, there's a travel day all the time uh, going from one city to another. Here, they're all in one spot. So at first, the recovery has been really good, but we're going to see what that pattern is going to, how that will continue uh, as the playoffs will continue because these guys are playing at a very high level after having time off. So our job is monitoring that level, but then really monitoring that recovery as well uh, mm -hmm. and then looking at different recovery treatments. Because some We had a pivot a little bit of recovery treatments as well, the technology there because of the limitations that we had. Uh, like you couldn't bring in uh, hot tubs and cold tubs be, uh, into the bubble. We, there, there was no place to drain the water. So, so it's, there's a lot of moving pieces with uh, this technology right now. Um, okay. And, so. Nice. Uh, uh, talking about wiring, uh, um, Marco, you worked for Polar. So the most famous, I guess, is the, the wrist belt with the sensor. Um, but I know you also... You, you, I mean, once in our um, event, you presented also a, a watch, uh, a tracker on the wrist, um, a, a wrist, uh, a wrist watch, by, and a, a chest belt, right? So, um, where do you think, um, like the qual talking about quality of data? So, um, yeah. Wara Ring is placed at the finger. Maybe that's a different thing than placing a sensor on the chest. W yeah. Where do you yeah. see like uh, sure. technology? So if we think about like the, the the tracking of heart rate, there are it, it, so much depends on the use case. So I think Aura did a brilliant job with a very elegant design, very discreet with the ring ring like uh, heart rate tracking. They measure other things from there as well. But but uh, with Polar, which is actually the original pioneer in heart rate tracking uh, for athletes, uh, the the chest strap is still by far the most accurate, especially in a sports scenario. But, uh, and, uh, and uh, you know, like if you're really moving around, swinging your arms, lots of like uh, aggressive movement, uh, the, the chest is the chest strap, especially now with the cloth uh, fabric textile chest straps, they're very comfortable, much more comfortable than in the past and, and very reliable and very accurate. That said, 
that's not the optimum for all sorts of situations. So, uh, for example, Polar and as as well as many other companies have also um, uh, implemented the PPG heart rate tracking on the backside of the watch, whether it's Apple Watch or Polar. And these have been getting also uh, uh, making huge increments in terms of improvement and accuracy and reliability uh, over the years. And uh, and they work very, very well, but I, I, they still have their challenges, like in sports, like, for example, racket sports like tennis, uh, that the types of sports where you're going to have aggressive uh, pendulous mo movements of the arms. But uh, by, by at least through that, you're also it's so much more convenient because you don't have to put on that extra chest sensor as well. And, uh, you know, it's, it, it, at, the, at the end of the day, it comes down to what's the use case and, uh, you know, and how, what, how granular do you want the data to be? So, so uh, it, for many of the fitness people, even if there's a little bit of latency on the heart rate when you do hard intervals, that's not the end of the day. But for professional athletes, it's, it's very key to get within like one or two beats uh, and and have a high degree of re repeatability. Mm -hmm. And and then at the end of the day, um, I think it's also key uh, to have meaningful data. That means like information more than just the data set. So um, maybe Mark, uh, if we think about uh, yeah this 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 way of new training, um, I mean, do you think this can replace a trainer, or how do you see? the the future of, of of working together with with people who do fitness yeah i think i wanted to go back to your uh, initial question mm -hmm. if technology is here to stay or the waves that we see right now and it's super interesting to hear paul um and marco explain it from their point of view on, on, on their questions and i think um yeah like it's absolutely here to stay but i think there's always uh, one question is always coming up and this is like will it replace and i think this is a fundamental wrong question you know if you look at if you look at the I think the the involvement of the industry. I think there is a there is a, a strong and significant human component to it, you know. And I think there are two major parts to really think about that. When we consider a new environment with the technology influx, what is here? And I believe, Marco, you said it. It wasn't um, not present before COVID nineteen. I think COVID nineteen just might accelerate some things or might just go to prioritize things. Technology was there before, and I think Paul can agree on that quite um, as well. So I think now it's just in the forefront of, of a lot of people. And there are two things. First, I think we need to think about in the future about the heterogeneity of our clientele, making sure who we are designing for. You know, and a lot of the times when we look at some of the uh, the companies and the use cases, we talk about a specific category of, of clientele. And I think we also need to think on what about the elderly, for example, what about rehab, or what about maybe some other um, factors where it might be a significant category of potential clients using fitness uh, technology. So I think that's the first thing. And the second thing is um, the the involvement of a coach needs to be significant, you know? And I think that is something what might gonna be now a bit challenged with the opportunities with um, technology. The, the coach is supposed to evolve in a way that they understand what technology brings, understand data, and understand the client as well, you know, with being a concierge or being like a navigator through those those opportunities. So those are my, my two cents on that question, if it's here to stay mm -hmm. or not. Thanks, um, uh, Marco. We we talked about this topic before, so um, I think what you were mentioning is that the professional trainers in professional sports rather uh, uh, more likely pick up the technology um, from Kinexon, Polar, Catapult, um, and and personal in the personal environment, it's rather slow the uh, establishment of of these new technologies. Would you like to to give some insights on these thoughts? Yeah, well, I mean, there's just been an incredible like uh, 180 degree shift in the professional sports world when it comes to using the technology. So already back in 2002, 2003, when I started with Polar, and we had team clients back then as well, a lot of the head coaches hated the whole concept of having their players monitored and, and any type of like data was kind of seen as that was just kind of like a distraction. It was noise. The coaches had a certain, like a, just like a, a very strong sense that they knew five them, minutes. themselves from, from like, uh, five, you know, ten? they don't need tech, tech to tell them what to do. A lot of them had never even used a laptop. So it's pretty amazing to now to see 
how like the technology has been embraced at the top. But that said, like I think uh, what what Mark men mentioned as well that there's like a learning curve for especially for personal trainers uh, in terms of how to take that take what the, the data that's coming off of these devices and really make it meaningful for the clients. And it's also a challenge for the category still. I think there's been a huge amount of pro progress to be able to really make uh, the user guidance very simple and experience the journey for the client to really be, have actionable data uh, on the wrist or, or through, the, through the app to be able to understand what's happening and why am I doing what I'm doing and stay motivated that way and make progress um, but but uh, it's almost like I would say there's a paradox. The very most basic fitness enthusiast needs the most hand hold, holding, and and like in that sense, the most advanced algorithms in the background to make things look very simple. And and uh, at the very elite level, with a lot of the teams, they have like uh, 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 multiple analysts and data crunchers who then work with the coaches to give them very granular feedback uh, through the different coaching teams. So that's that's where like then the device just has to be super reliable and and uh, it doesn't necessarily need to do so much interpretation uh, to spoon feed the data to the clients. Okay, great. Um, um, and Paul, um, what is your experience uh, when presenting the data? If you work together with the teams and the trainers, um, what what is your experience when it comes to representing data or to giving some information to them? Um, have you been thinking about implementing AI algorithms or something like that? Is that a topic at Kinexon for you? Definitely. And just going back to what Marco said about the, you know he said themes back in you know like two thousand and two. Yes, it's been a very slow process. Uh, like I said, I started working with some technology when I first started, uh, or, or bought some technology to uh, athletes' performance back in 99. So we were doing it early on, and it was more of, what does this data mean? How do we use it? Now we're to the point um, that it's not all teams. Uh, it definitely everyone's a, a little bit different, but now they're starting to understand that um, what are we going to do? And how can we pivot uh, our recovery treatments uh, on someone, especially, again, I'm using the example of the bubble, USTA, we actually, uh, the tennis players are now, because we need talk eye data, they're actually making some action, not just on load management. Everybody talks about load management all the time. That's just one small piece. It's like, yeah, there's, there's so much load, and these guys are in the playoffs. They're going to push to these loads. I need them. We, we need to. But how do we recover them? How do we understand what the loads were to use different recovery treatments um, and technology so we can get them back on and play them the total minutes? Because I will never talk to a coach or, or uh, a team about restricting minutes. I'm always talking about how do we get them in the best condition to, you know, play the next game and uh, prepare them for those games. So that's how we've really shifted it. Um, then some of the technology that's out, I mentioned they were rigging a little bit, but then there's things like Plantigo, which are the inserts in the shoes, where we can actually see some asymmetry. But now we're getting to some uh, real detailed data at this level um, because, again, coming back to recovery, injury prevention type of uh, training. So uh, they've slowly bought into it. Uh, and again, it's still not 100%. Um, but it's a long, we've come a long way since uh, 2002. And uh, um, it's, it's comes down from the general manager and head coach uh, to how much they will actually buy into it. Um, and then, then there's the staff below them, how much they will actually try to collect. But we try to keep it very simple. I use, I think there's you know, some companies that we hear out there, they have 140 metrics. We use four. Keep it simple. Uh, understand what those four are. Maybe dive yeah. into five and six if we need to. But yeah. it's got to be pretty simple. Okay. okay. Great. Um, like data can be overwhelming, but data can also be very, very worthful and also intimate. And especially when it comes to the rest of us, you know, like the mainstream fitness guys. Um, so um, there's one top elephant in the room, like uh, Google acquired Fitbit. Uh, um, and uh, 
what do we think about this? Like, is it is it uh, um, because there's one component? Yes, it's about fitness, but it's also maybe about data harvesting. So, how do we handle these? this factor of um, there's a lot of data, personal interests, fitness interests. Marco, what is your opinion towards this? <laughs> yeah, well, it's like it's a, it's a bit of a double-edged sword. I think, uh, you know, if um, uh, the, these entities are, are working, you know, for uh, they want to help people. I think that's if, if, if you if you want your data to be able to bring more meaning to you, you have to be able to combine different types of data. So for example, the sleep data and the performance data and maybe your nutrition and genetics and all, all those things come together. So there is a trust factor that needs to be there. And I think if uh, Google would, will need to be able to communicate in a very clear and understandable fashion and build the trust amongst the clientele of, of Fitbit uh, to go forward, not just Google, but everybody in the whole space. I think uh, right now, because of, for example, the TikTok situation in the US, that's going to create, that's going to be the catalyst for, I think, in the US really opening up the discussion that we had in Europe some years ago with the GDPR and really kind of like, really like, let's say, like have a reckoning in terms of who's getting what data and what's being shared. And uh, I think that's that's just the fitness space is just one more in this whole area, uh, because you know, if 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 you're if you're being tracked twenty four seven, the way the algorithms have, are are evolving now, they can pretty soon and they can already start to detect certain underlying, let's say, uh, conditions. Whether you're you're getting depressed, uh, or whether there's some kind of like substance abuse, or 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 uh, th th those types of things. So there is definitely like it's it's not just like a tinfoil hat paranoia. Um, but so there, there needs to be some clear guidelines and rules for all the players. Mm -hmm. That's that, that's my two cents on it. I mean, mm -hmm. if you have a look at the modern um, mobile phone cameras, like uh, they, it seems like they have reached a certain physical barrier, and now they switch to AI algorithms to improve uh, picture quality. And and wow. I mean, uh, at a certain point, everything will uh, switch to to data analysis and and making sense of this. So maybe this could also be beneficial for us. But wow. um, I mean. Is there, um, Paul or, or Mark, uh, do you have a comment on this as well? Um, Paul, please go ahead. <laughs> as far as the, the data, I mean, um, I want to just go back on the, the whole thing on uh, I or anything like that for the, the general population, even though I work mainly in professional athletes, I still think that type of technology or something like that is extremely motivating to the, uh, the clients, uh, the general population, which I think is huge, uh, especially right now, get them out, get them active. So I know that there's a lot of data in the background, but if I can just give you some basic information to keep you motivated, to keep you active, I think that's, I think that's a, a huge plus in a product like that. Uh, now, data quality will have to get better if people are going to be using it more and more, but uh, I think we're getting there, but that's where I see it is the data quality just has to get better. So then we can do true insights on how we can help somebody. Uh, <clears throat> you know, right now it's just the general, the number of steps you take. Oh, that's good. At least you're collecting something um, and getting them motivated. But if we're really going to truly help someone for fitness, we got to just do a little bit better with the quality of the data in, um, in interpreting that and giving them quick feedback on what that really means. So... That's where I see a lot of this wearable has got to go. Cool, thanks. Mark, you also wanted to mention something. We are running towards the last minute yeah. of just our a, conversation. Just a quick thought on it, and I think um, both both uh, comments are super valuable. I want to just kind of say what, what Marco said. I think trust is a, is a key word for me. You know, I think there is an ability of, of technology giving us information about ourselves, and I think we need to understand how we're going to use that and how potentially third parties going to use it, doctors, coaches, uh, physiotherapists, uh, and all that. So I think um, we ne we should not forget that it's not trivial to get information and then we have information and we can do something about it. I think there's a story and there's a there's a, a continuity behind what we need to uh, definitely keep in mind with the future developments. Thank you, Mark.
Um, now um, we're shortly before the startup pitches or the startup presentations. And um, like a little bit of a transition to this topic, I also have a final question for you guys. So if you were to found a startup in the, in the fin fitness tech world, um, what, where would you go? Like which problem would you like to solve or what would be your idea? <laughs> um, you don't have to give away your, your secret startup plans, but let us at least know uh, which direction you would go. Like uh, Marco, maybe you want to start? Yeah. So like, uh, actually it's a good, uh, connection to the, to the previous topic. So when it comes to data, I think that, uh, I would, I would invest in a startup that would start to like do deeper, uh, AI analysis of the, of the, of the data out there to try to identify patterns, uh, and, uh, and to be able to build a whole different types of solutions on that based on certain sub segments within that. So I, know, I can't go into, there's not too much detail I should go into now, but I think that there's, there's a lot of data out there that it has yet to be, let's say, analyzed and, and there's a lot of value that could be brought from that and a lot of learnings to be able to develop new things going forward. Great. Um, Paul, what is your startup idea? <laughs> yes, just going off of Marcos real quick at the AX. So yes, that's something that we're really focusing on right now. Um, and especially with some of our um, technology for i don't i hate to say the injury prevention because it's gonna it's a really tough subject but uh we are doing some of that right now and looking at uh post uh recovery uh treatment but if i was going to invest in something i you can probably guess that based on what i brought up a few times it's like it's around recovery um and it's more now what i'm looking at is how do i get you to to sleep earlier? Uh, how do I get you to um, calm down after uh, an event? Uh, could be, you know, uh, either a late night out or uh, our athletes uh, playing an event to get them to relax so we can get them to sleep. So it's in, without medications uh, and, and everything else that's out there that they're they're doing to, to try to relax. Some technology, and there's some out there that I've been playing around with. There's a company called Apollo that we've been looking at. Uh, but, how to get them to recover because to me that is the most important thing in any uh, my professional athletes also way to the dental population especially people with young kids stressful jobs how do we get them to relax to get a good night's sleep not just monitoring their sleep how do we get them to a good night's okay. sleep? okay great Thank you, Paul. Um, we are a little bit running out of time. I'm getting signs here from the backstage crew. So Mark, maybe a short intro to into your idea. A, a very short one so we keep the, the time in mind i think it's about uh, connected facilities you know i think there's uh, gym managers coaches um, chains um, and i would definitely think on providing a solution and um, a uh, some sort of consultation on how to use the current opportunities to uh, further thrive their business